family mode. Good morning and welcome to the April 6th, 2021 Lane County Board of Commissioners meeting. Um, interesting to note, forgive me, but on this day in 1940, the United States issued its first stamp to honor an African American and that was educator, public speaker, and presidential advisor, Booker T. Washington. And another thing I thought was interesting on this date, in 1948, um, the World Health Organization was formed by the United Nations, and this country, once again, is a member of that esteemed body. So having said that, with no further ado, um, are there any item number one on our adjust agenda? Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Seeing none, item number two, is there any emergency business? No emergency business from staff. Seeing none, um, this is the uh, agenda item for public comments to the public watching. Uh, you're registered in this meeting system as attendees. Attendees are webinar participants and audience members viewing the meeting. Your microphone and webcam are automatically muted as attendees. Um, at this time, if you wish to participate in public comment, and we hope that you do, um, we will ask you to raise your virtual hand to be recognized. You will see the hand icon on the device you are using to watch the meeting. Press once. When public comment begins today, Judy will call names. When your name is called, you will be asked to speak, and as soon as you uh, have spoken for a maximum of three minutes, we will mute you uh, to give others an opportunity to speak as well. So at this time, Judy, are there any people desiring to make public comments to the board? Good morning. I do see some folks here. So at this time, if you could raise your virtual hand, and um, as Chair Bernie mentioned, I will start the three minute timer once we know that your audio is working. Um, and I do see some hands going off and on. And just a, a note there, it is a, a toggle feature. So if it is clicked on and off, it will um, put your hand down. So I do see, I'm gonna call um, John Farkas at this time. And John, I'm going to unmute you. It looks like you are self-muted, but once you're ready to go, I will start the timer. I see your, there you go. Can you hear us? Yes, can you hear? Yes, yes. sir, we can. Anyway, uh, my issue is this, I am 85 years old. In 2010, I finally did my post-retirement dream, a so-called pole barn, a simple barn, and became my woodworking and my uh, uh, hobby shop, cabinet making shop. It burned down, in the meanwhile, the flood plan changed. So I submitted a permit request three months ago to rebuild exactly the same building. It was a kit. It's going to be exactly the same on the previous foundation. And because there was a slight change in the flood plan, I, I am still not with the permit. I already paid $300 initially, then $623 to review the flood plan. Now, the waterway in question for this floodplain is a seasonal little creek. It dries out by the end of April and does not become a, a waterway until the end of November. So why, why does the committee or the building department make it so difficult to rebuild something that was exactly the same? And why can I not get a small variance? I, being 85 years old, I do not have a lot of time left after the building is left, is uh, completed. And lastly, if your committee decides to waive fees, uh, would we receive, mine is over $900, will we receive a, a refund? And that is all I need to, I wanted to say, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity and, and hoping you, you're gonna make it easier for people to rebuild something that was 
okay 10 years ago and it's apparently not okay but by now and thank you very much and uh, i will enjoy listening to the rest of your discussions thank you ladies and gentlemen that's it thank you for your public comment um, at this time, that is all that we have here for uh, in the attendees. So I will turn it back over to you, Chair Bernie. Would any commissioners like to make any remonstrances or respond to the public comment at this time? Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. I'm not sure if the person who spoke was part of the Holiday Farm Fire, but it just in case, I will look into that, and I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us this morning. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Chair Bernie. Uh, and Commissioner Buck, Buck, Buck brought up a point that I was going to ask about. Mr. Barkis did not state his address, only his name at the start of his uh, testimony today. So I wonder if uh, somehow we can make sure that we do have his address on file also. Um, thank you. Mr. Farkas, if you're listening, I'm going to go out of protocol here. Could you state your address? Normally, that's that is uh, what people do before they make a public comment, and especially in your instance, it would be very relevant. Maybe it's too late. Yeah, we may need to just okay. check with Judy to see if because uh, she may need to let him back in if he's still there. Okay. He's still there, and I did um, unmute him. Uh, John Farkas, if you're hearing us and if you're able to speak, it looks like you are self-muted. Um, if you'd like to, to chime in, that would be great. I'm not. That's fine. I'm going to move forward. I wanted him to give him yeah. that opportunity. Here we go. Anyway, yes, it, I am part of the Holiday Fire Farm. I live on Goose Pasture Road, 45845 Goose Pasture Road. And it was part of the Holiday Farm uh, Fire. That's, that's great. I'm sorry, sir, go ahead. You know, the last two, two odd buildings, this is just one of them. The other one was a consumed tractor, uh, two tractors, two cars, and just virtually all of my sporting equipment. Thank you very much, sir. And I, it, I don't know if you could see, but uh, several commissioners were shaking their head in acknowledgement. Commissioner Buck identified she wrote it down and she's going to follow up. I very much appreciate that. As I said, my, my time is somewhat limited because of my age. And I, I, I hear you loud and clear, sir. <laughs> Uh, we're going to move on now, but but expect a call from Commissioner Buck, who's going to be following up on this. Um, are there any other commissioners that would make like to make a comment or remonstrance? Seeing none, um, and forgive me, I neglected to state that we are going to have to organize our morning. This board will be in recess at 1130 this morning and will reconvene at 1.30 this afternoon. Um, item five, County Administration, Mr. Mokrohyski. Thank you, Chair. I'll turn it over to Mr. Adams to uh, give you an update. We have had some um, uh, interesting developments in, in our COVID-19 uh, response and recovery efforts, both on the case count front and the vaccination front. And so we'll have Mr. Adams walk you through all those details. Steve. Thank you, Steve, Chair Bernie, Commissioners. It's uh, a pleasure to uh, be before you uh, this morning. Um, it is uh, definitely, I think, an eventful morning on the uh, COVID front. I do have a few slides to present here. Okay. Just navigating. There we are. Okay. Um, so, uh, Commissioners, presumably you can see the familiar epi curve here in front of you. Wonderful. Uh, the uh, so uh, as we uh, 
as you've you've noted, uh, certainly I think in in uh, Steve's uh, uh, daily updates, uh, we have seen an increase in cases. Um, just over the the past weekend, uh, we had 116 reported. Um, those numbers are captured in this graphic as of yesterday. And just within the last 24 hours, we've had an additional 35 cases. Uh, reported, um, and and uh, we're seeing an increase in those uh, being tracked in the community um, as infectious, actively infectious. Um, we have 10 in hospital, one of whom is uh, within an ICU bed. Uh, we've had no new uh, reported deaths over the last 24 hours. Um, and so, uh, you know, of course, this curve tracks the course of the pandemic since last year. And so um, it might be helpful just to zoom in on that top uh, little curve. So this is what the epi curve looks like over the last 30 days. Um, so you see the downward trend uh, that uh, in the early part of this graphic that um, helped us coast into a low category and just, just break um, that uh, 50 cases per 100,000 limit. Um, and then we've seen a steady increase as we went into um, spring break, um, and we continue to see those cases. And I would just uh, note for the board that the last couple of days here are not fully uh, registering in our tracking system as of yet, as it tends to take a couple of days um, for our cases to uh, catch up for this um, graphic. So this, of course, um, is manifest then in our um, current risk level, which was uh, released uh, this morning. Uh, uh, by state government. So you see in the last two weeks, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, now at 88.7 cases per 100,000, um, placing us firmly in moderate risk and certainly trending um, towards high risk. Uh, so we're still absorbing this, but I believe you all received a communication from the governor's office um, that they would be announcing later today a change in the extreme risk category to include um, hospital capacity, which is something that we've advocated for. Um, and so um, as we understand this new guidance, and again, we're still absorbing it, um, Wayne County could presumably move as high as high risk um, without these new metrics kicking in. But um, a metric around hospital capacity would have to be exceeded in order for us to move back into extreme risk. Um, uh, the commissioners will also recall that um, the movement of uh, counties from one risk category to another um, has been that process has been modified in recent weeks as um, as counties have been that have previously moved down are granted a two week uh, uh, kind of uh, period a, a circuit breaker if you will in order to uh, before movement actually happens so today being Tuesday the sixth um, without that circuit breaker we would be moving into moderate risk as of this coming Friday. Uh, with the circuit breaker, there's a two-week abeyance of that movement up into moderate risk. Um, that gives us some time to engage more proactively with our community uh, in order to be able to um, really share some of the messages that I think are so important. Um, just to give you some flavor of what we're seeing out there with respect to some of the case investigations um, as, as these cases roll in, we're, we're really seeing new cases coming um, right across demographic boundaries. We're not seeing a preponderance of cases within one age category or one socioeconomic category. It's right across the board. And some of what we're seeing is really just indicators of how weary folk are of the pandemic, uh, fine uh, spring weather, um, and you know certainly kind of some sense of relief um, after the county moved into lower risk and we began to see an increase in um, and economic um, activity um, from our small business sector and, and others. Um, so we're seeing gatherings. Uh, we're seeing uh, 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 extended families get, you know, who live across multiple households getting together, and we're then seeing um, uh, case transmission from one household to another. And then once within the household, we're seeing um, uh, transmission from one member of the household to others within the household. Um, we. Um, really are um, cautioning folk that the end is nearly in sight at this moment. Every new case, every new hospitalization, um, and certainly every new death uh, with the end so close in sight is really a tragedy. 
uh, the, the, the continuing message of the importance of, um, of continuing those social distancing measure, measures, hand washing and masking is incredibly important at this moment. Uh, and then, of course, seeing, uh, uh, you know, and uh, communicating to individuals the importance of receiving a vaccination as soon as it is available to us. Um, the um, uh, we've seen a couple of cases within the last week from long term care facilities. Um, but what we're seeing is that it is staff rather than residents. Um, and, and these are staff who um, were not previously uh, vaccinated. Um, we've seen uh, a couple of instances of um, cases amongst K-12 teachers. Again, in both instances, the teachers were not vaccinated. They declined vaccine when it was available to them. So the importance of, of, of getting uh, vaccinated uh, cannot be um, uh, really just um, uh, uh, overly simplified, it's critical to where we are. So moving then into vaccinations. Um, so I showed this slide uh, three weeks ago now, it's mistitled uh, March 15. I wanted to come back to this slide because it is, um, it is the last date in which um, OHA uh, gave us data that uh, uh, really is something that we can lean on. Um, for um, we learned last week that um, all of the county level data that OHA um, was pushing out to the state was being pushed out um, in error. There was um, a data cleaning glitch on their side that misidentified doses going to specific counties. Um, and OHA, you, it, for those of you who are tracking the OHA indicators, um, uh, you may have noticed that the county level uh, vaccination trends has been down with kind of a dog ate my homework message out there for the general public. Um, so uh, as of the 15th of March, we knew that we had 79,000 uh, people vaccinated uh, in Lane County. Um, uh, and we um, uh, have have had a bit of a gulf in terms of our uh, data uh, uh, availability moving forward. So we've been really kind of focusing specifically on the data that we know. So the shots that we are doing internally. Um, and uh, just this just overnight, we received a new dump of data from OHA with corrected uh, information. And I wanted to uh, share that with you and I will do so in a moment. But as we look at our own data, uh, uh, the graphic on the right hand side of the screen uh, really kind of ties back to some of the news that we're going to hear later today. So uh, presumably, um, President Biden is going to announce uh, that uh, he is going to direct states to open vaccinations to the full general population as of April 19th. Um, some of, of his remarks uh, reportedly are going to focus on the weekend um, just passed, um, in which on Saturday for the first time um, nationwide, we administered over 4 million doses in a, in a um, single day. Um, uh, that was followed by a, a, a very high 3 million uh, dose day on Sunday. So if you look at this weekend in this moment of celebration, uh, doses reached uh, the arms of 2.3% of the national population. But when you look at what happened here in Wayne County over the weekend, um, we were uh, successful in administering 10,725 doses only at two of our three drive through sites. Um, and this is only Wayne County's uh, uh, effort with our uh, a wonderful uh, volunteer corps, we uh, provided doses to 2.9% of our population. So we did our bit to uh, bump up that national average and, and even pull it forward. So um, uh, that then is translating into uh, some, some coverage data that I think, um, I hope uh, brings this uh, board some comfort in our efforts to provide vaccine to our population. Um, so if we look now just at 65% plus vaccinations in the county, you can see uh, first dose coverage on the left-hand side of your screen, um, second full, fully vaccinated coverage on the right-hand side of your screen. So we are um, seeing that our most populous uh, uh, vaccination rates are just wildly beyond expectation, 96%, uh, 100% and a couple of zip codes even um, uh, coverage um, fairly uniformly across the county 
Um, and these data, as you um, as we publish them uh, to Tableau, which we will be doing, enables you to mouse over each zip code to see how many people are within those zip codes. Um, so we have uh, 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 gotten doses countywide into the arms of 81.3% of our 65 plus population uh, and 56.3% uh, of our 65 plus population are now fully vaccinated. Um, this will really show up in uh, this case surge that we're seeing um, uh, nationally as we read the, the accounts of uh, the upper Midwest in the Northeast where we're seeing uh, the, the surge uh, perhaps more fully uh, manifest. Um, the hospitalization uh, demographics are changing. It's younger folk who are uh, being hospitalized. Um, so we have some comfort that uh, the vaccination efforts to date are protecting um, our elder population as we move into this. So um, we now pivot into looking specifically at, and I should note too, these data do not include our Sunday vaccination. So these, there's, there were five, over 5,000 doses delivered, which have yet to show up in these data. Um, if we look at a percentage of the county as a whole, all of our population, um, we're now at uh, nearly 33%. A third of our county has received at least one dose of vaccine. Um, we're now at 20% of our county who, is, uh, who are fully vaccinated. And I would, I would note for the commissioners that uh, the lower um, age limit uh, for uh, the Pfizer vaccine is 16 years old, uh, whereas Moderna and um, uh, um, uh, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine are labeled for 18 and older. So if we pull out the age eligible, which I would uh, show you at this point, uh, uh, 16 plus, um, you see that uh, uh, the data change uh, just a little bit here as we have uh, obviously uh, been focused on the older end of our population. Uh, but as of now, as we think about um, herd immunity, a third of our county has received a single dose and uh, one in five in our county has um, received their second dose. Uh, so that's where we stand today. So with our vaccine allocations uh, coming into the county, last week was a down week. We received about 13,000 doses through our state channel. Um, and then when we crunched the data about what we understood coming through the federal retail pharmacy program, it was an additional 7,000 doses coming into the county last week um, for uh, vaccination. As we look into this current operating week, um, we're receiving uh, uh, over 20,000 doses um, coming into the county just through the state channel. Um, and specifically, we are uh, uh, expecting a similar, if not uh, slightly elevated uh, uh, amount coming through that federal retail pharmacy channel as well. And then we have um, the uh, federally qualified health center channel in which we had previously been receiving 500 doses a week. That is growing to 1,000 doses um, for the CHCs. And then uh, in, within a couple of weeks, we anticipate that White Bird is another um, uh, uh, FQ that has been approved to participate, it will be receiving federal vaccine as well. So this week we can reasonably anticipate that we're in the high 20,000 range of doses coming into the county through all channels. Um, and uh, we of course have been awaiting um, and planning for, uh, for some weeks now, a surge in um, allocations coming into Wayne County for, uh, through the state channel. So um, we specifically uh, were assigned a planning target of just over 30,000 doses, uh, which was to include the big Johnson & Johnson surge. Uh, uh, that has yet to materialize. We did receive 2,200 doses of Johnson & Johnson this week, um, but we're being advised that we will not see any next week. Uh, many of you probably saw the national news that um, there was a uh, production error at uh, Emergent, one of the contract uh, producers for Johnson & Johnson, which resulted in the spoilage of 15 million doses. Um, the federal government has intervened in that production facility, and um, we're being advised that they will begin to bring uh, production up to a larger scale um, fairly soon. Um, so we continue to await. Um, we're currently operating at about... Uh, 
uh, two two thirds uh, for this operating week of that expected surge. Um, and Chair Bernie, um, you asked me to come back this week uh, uh, with a, a kind of a diagram of what uh, our short run plan was for allocating the surge. Um, so this pie chart on the left hand side of your screen indicates that um, uh, this is how we plan to uh, allocate 34,000 doses um, coming into Lane County. 16,000 is our capacity for mass vax um, operations at our three sites. Um, uh, uh, Peace Health has, uh, is, is conducting uh, just over 2,700 shots a week at three sites throughout the county. Uh, we have an incredible machine with our search and rescue uh, with just a small team able to deliver a thousand shots a week. And we are uh, actively and, and demonstrated that capacity in Florence. And we're moving that operation around um, elsewhere in the county uh, next Monday to Cottage Grove. And we're looking at sites in Benita and in Junction City to be able to bring vaccine further out. Uh, they're also returning this coming Sunday to do boost doses up the McKinsey um, uh, corridor that was affected by the uh, Holiday Farm fire, and we'll be adding additional first doses to that run as well. Um, we're allocating on a weekly basis 2,000 doses for community-led clinics with our community-based partners. And then you see um, the, the 13,000 or so doses being allocated to pharmacies, uh, retail pharmacies that are not participating in the federal retail pharmacy program, as well as our um, uh, primary care providers and, and medical clinics throughout um, uh, Lane County. So our plan is to really kind of maximize uh, our mass vax capability, get as many shots in arms because this is the most efficient means we can use in the short run. Um, but as we get through May and into June, um, we believe that the mass vax channel uh, will have um, really kind of reached maximum impact. And we will begin to dial this back where we begin to push more and more doses into the pharmacy and the primary care provider channels and then reserve doses um, for specific um, efforts, outreach efforts, both getting into rural areas um, as well as uh, uh, working with our uh, community-based organization partners to uh, stand up and add more doses to um, our community-led clinics as we go throughout the um, uh, go throughout the summer. So, uh, commissioners, that is my presentation for you this morning. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Adams. Are there any commissioners that would like to uh, ask a question or or make a comment? Yes, Vice Chair Farr. Uh, Chair Bernie, I just want, and Steve Adams, I just wanted to mention that uh, twice over the weekend and uh, throughout yesterday, two times, I heard the praise of search and rescue uh, for the job that they're doing in, in managing. And, uh, you know, uh, most of the individuals there are volunteers who operate through the Sheriff's Department. And uh, just wanted to uh, throw it, throw, you know, to, uh, cheer out to them. Uh, they're doing it on their spare time. Uh, they're not the spare time, but their volunteer time. That's pretty remarkable. The job that we're getting uh, through the people that you have employed, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yes, Commissioner Trigger. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for again a really informative and, and exciting presentation, Mr. Adams. It's always great to hear from you. It's just incredible work that's happening. I have sort of a series of kind of just clarifying questions, um, and I want to overlay it with a, a, a question about data accuracy. If I'm understanding you, we can completely and absolutely trust our own Lane County's data about Lane County's um, vaccine rollout, and that if I'm understanding you, the issue with the data coming from the state is less that we can't trust. Um, the OHA, but that it's sort of like a game of telephone that as data gets filtered through various channels, um, sometimes things get lost in the translation. So it's less about um, integrity when it comes to trusting data and just a matter of the closer to the source, the more accurate the data. Would, is that is that a, a correct way of stating what what um, what you just shared with us? So, um... Chair Bernie, thank you, Commissioner. Indeed, um, so the data issue was one of a data cleaning uh, software that OHA was employing. Um, and it was that 
data cleaning software that was misassigning doses um, to, and, and it was noticeable in some of our Eastern Oregon counties who all of a sudden were vaccinating at, you know, 120% of their population. Um, and so OHA, to their great credit, advised everyone, took those data down, identified the problem, um, but it was only in the county data field that we had a problem. So they're working on that and fixing that and pushing that out. We anticipate that that will be corrected. But indeed, we know how many doses we administer, so we can we count that and um, we have good good uh, confidence in what we're reporting. Great, thank you. And again, our numbers and the numbers you're reporting are exclusive of the federal pharmacy program, correct? So there's actually more vaccine going out in our county than what you're reporting. Is that right? That is correct. Um, though the federal pharmacy doses administered um, in the percentages by zip code would show up. So that is from all providers. Okay, great, thank you. A um, Couple more questions. The um, more younger people being hospitalized, do we know if that's related to variants or, or anything else about the nature of the virus versus how people are becoming infected or, or anything else that we know about that? So, um, uh, indeed, we, um, uh, we are not seeing that locally um, yet. Um, we have had some detections of variants here in the state, as you know. Our sequencing uh, uh, capabilities are, are growing, uh, and state government has put a protocol in place for identifying cultures for, uh, for sequencing. Uh, what we are reading nationally in the upper Midwest and in the Northeast, yes, um, you're seeing very high uh, transmission of the UK variant, the B117. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a couple more, if I may, Chair. Um, the sure. Johnson & Johnson, are we, are we still sort of reserving and prioritizing that for harder to reach populations? Is that the, is that the plan with the, the Johnson & Johnson? Hard, folks that would be harder to do second follow-up visits, um, unsheltered folks, and, and so on. Chair Bernie, indeed. Yes, Commissioner Trigger. Uh, that is, uh, with the 2,200 doses, we are reserving that um, for our um, harder-to-reach populations, including a clinic uh, this Friday, I believe, for the mission, uh, as an example. Great. Thank you. Um, just two more. One is if you could clarify on the pie chart, the 9,000 that are going to clinics, which is a separate number from community led clinics. Is that, I just wanted to make sure I understand what's included in that private medical. Is that, yeah, can you, can you share the difference between community led clinics and clinics as two categories of distribution? Uh, Chair Bernie, that's a great question, Commissioner. So uh, by clinics, uh, I meant primary care providers in large measure uh, versus community-led clinics. Uh, these are pop-up activities that we did. Um, for instance, the 100 doses that we provided to LULAC uh, members last Wednesday at the fairgrounds. Terrific. Thank you. And finally, um, with the differential in um, as teens become, <clears throat> pardon me, eligible for vaccine, uh, you said the Pfizer is approved for 16 to 18 and Moderna for 18 and above. So as people start to schedule their teens for appointments, um, one, it, is it required that a parent does the scheduling or can the teen do it themselves? And two, how are we ensuring we have the right number of doses for that 16 to 18 that, that, there's, that there's Pfizer? Is that part of the scheduling process? Indeed, it is. So, um, uh, uh, individuals 16 and above, I, I believe that the, the age limit is actually lower under Oregon law, can make their own medical decisions in the state. Um, so um, uh, an individual 16 and above can schedule themselves. Uh, you enter your birth date and your age as part of the registration process. And um, if you are less than 18, it's not going to show you any Moderna clinic. Um, it's only going to show you Pfizer clinic. So that's how we're um, dealing with that on the front end, um, and then of course we're verifying age um, as we go through the through the clinics as well. Great, thank you. That, those were all my questions. Thank you so much for for the information. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any other commissioners that would like to make comments or ask questions uh, to Mr. Adams? Yes, Commissioner Bozovich. Real quick, Steve, can it? You mentioned that the uh, by zip code vaccinations were going to be on Tableau. Again, I'm trying to find them and I'm having trouble finding them on the website. 
Indeed. Uh, Chiverni, thank you, Commissioner Bozovich. My intent was to publish those last week, um, but then we got word that those data were suspect. So we stepped back away from that uh, and we did not publish. I, you know, even it, I, I'm ashamed to say the data I presented to you last week apparently was suspect data um, with misassigned doses. Um, and we only learned of this on Wednesday. So we pulled that back. And now with these new data, this arrived last evening and the team has been working overnight to update our data. So now that we have confidence in these data, our intent is to publish this data out on our table at site. Is that it, Commissioner? Yep, just want to make sure I wasn't not finding something that was there. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions or comments? Um, Steve, it feels to me like um, one of the greatest enemy at this point in getting past this pandemic is complacency and fatigue. Um, what can we do about that, if anything? Because, because by the way, I, I'm I'm feeling that myself. It's not as if this is abstract. Um, I I must say I feel it as well, Chair Bernie. I I think it is it is the question of the hour, and I think um, I think. It is, we are so close. Um, truly, we are literally a couple of three months away. Um, I'm very concerned um, in the short run of, uh, particularly for our small business sector, some of the risks that they have taken to, as they've reopened, they have invested in inventory, they have staffed up, they've begun operations. Um, and in the short run, we want to protect uh, um, a life, obviously, uh, and we want to protect uh, uh, the well-being of individuals, but part of that is also the economic well-being of our small business sector as well. So um, we have done tremendous throughout the course of this pandemic, and we have nothing but thanks to offer to the broader public for all of their hard work over these, these uh, long months. Um, I am so eager to gather again with friends, uh, but we have to, uh, we have to, to uh, hold the line really in the, in the next couple of months to get us to that point. I think, um, I think as we look at these case counts, uh, certainly um, I hope this adds some urgency about the need to get vaccinated as soon as you possibly can. Uh, that is critical for getting us um, past this point where we can begin to kind of rejoin. Uh, but in the next couple of months, we need folk to continue to uh, uh, not engage in behavior that really kind of, um, I know we're done with the pandemic, but this virus isn't done with us um, until such time as we can get well, uh, more vaccine out there. If I may, the, the only answer to the question I heard, because the question is what can we, or what can public health do? And you reiterated, what the general population needs to do. Uh, it sounds to me like there's a new message here. Maybe I'm incorrect. And I don't know how you can saturate the touches to people. And that new message is, right, that we're a race against time. We yes. expand our capacity, get vaccinated. Yes. <laughs> it, that's just messaging. It, it truly is, Chair Bernie, and it's a great point. And it's, you know, um, Jason Davis, our incredible PIO, is, um, is messaging very hard on the front of continue to be vigilant, continue to take these measures, get vaccinated as quickly as you can. And, and that, is, that is the core of what we're communicating. And it is the core of what we're asking anyone with any reach and influence in the community continue to communicate as well. My, my daughter-in-law... Uh, is pregnant with my great <laughs> yeah yay but uh, her, her doctor was saying the data wasn't in until very recently about whether it was safe in fact for pregnant women to receive a vaccine not knowing the impact on the, the fetus uh, she learned that it was it was there was enough data that where her doctor recommended she do it she went yesterday to lane county's mass vax at the fairgrounds and her and my son have nothing but praise for the organization, the logistics. And it really sank in, and sometimes it's that visual, but it really sank into them that in the hour and 15 minutes they were there, they said probably about 300 people drove through and got vaccinated. And they were in their own minds reflecting that each person that gets vaccinated is probably stopping the spread you know, of, of multiples. And it was very interesting to hear a couple of young people with health concerns 
for a child, share their impressiveness with the operation um, and how it's finally hit home, how critical this is. Yeah. Um, I thought we were through, but Commissioner Trigger would like to make one last comment. Thank you, Chair. I just, what you were just, just listening to that exchange just briefly, I think the most important thing I heard, you know, what can public health do? Public health is doing all it can. It's messaging, it's standing up these clinics, it's sharing the data and the, and the science with community. And then the, what can we do? Um, what I heard both Chair Bernie and Mr. Adams say is it's really just about communicating people. This is, this is a challenging issue. And the more people can hear it from people they trust, that they have a personal connection and relationship to, that is actually what will what will move um, the needle for some folks. So it's phenomenal the public messaging, the public health messaging we're doing. But it's those personal relationships and connections. Um, and I will just say, you know, I end almost every phone call and meeting with, "Hey, if you want access to vaccine, have you been able to get yours yet?" Uh, just just making that a habit and a practice until we're through this, so people hear it. I think that personal connection and hearing it from people they trust and offering help um, with scheduling is, is the way to keep, is the way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Adams. Um, and thank you to every member of this board because this has been a Herculean effort. There have been no ideologies. There's been no partisanship. We're all in this together. And I believe we will together get on the other side. So again, thank you so much. Mr. Adams, and we are going to move on with the agenda. Um, we're now on item number six, consent calendar. Um, these are routine items that the Board of Commissioners looks at. There have been opportunities for commissioners to pull any item they would like additional information or discussion on. Um, I believe we've had no such requests, so uh, I'm, the chair is ready to entertain a motion. Chair Burning. Vice Chair Farr. Thank you, Chair. I move passage of the consent calendar for April 6, 2021. I'll second. Commissioner, thank you, Commissioner Buck. Commissioner Farr has moved and Commissioner Buck has second, seconded approval of the consent calendar for April 6, 2021. Is there any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Let the record show that um, the consent calendar was unanimously approved with a vote of five to zero. Uh, item seven, um, County Council, do you have any announcements for the board? I have no specific announcements for the board, but I am prepared to move to 7B. Well, if you would allow me to say 7B, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. 7B, discussion in the matter of amending Lane Code Chapter 2 to extend time to gather signatures for local measures, adopting a savings and severability clause, adopting an emergency clause, and adopting a sunset clause. Thank you for allowing me to say that. Mr. Dingle, you're on. All right. Uh, thank you, Chair Bernie, uh, members of the board. Um, you'll recall that this was uh, brought forward, I believe, initially by Commissioner Bozovich at the request of the folks who were circulating the uh, STAR voting measure. Um, after extensive discussion, which I hopefully have incorporated into this, we have um, uh, satisfied ourselves, or, I've satisfied myself that the board has this authority. Um, I've included everything in here to extend the time for them to gather signatures the, as a result of the COVID um, pandemic. Um, we have run it through uh, Mr. Rickoff's there, and I don't know if Ms. Young is. But anyway, we've run this, this particular ordinance through the, uh, the Lane County Equity Lens, and it has passed muster. So basically what I'm just looking for is to make sure before we uh, do the final form and schedule for first reading that there's not any additional input from any members of the board in terms of uh, this ordinance. I believe that's a call for questions or comments and Commissioner Trieger. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Dingle, I have one question. I see that it um, says that this expires, this goes through November of 2022. Um, and I'm wondering why it extends that many months 
past when, by my calculation, if we extend by six months, the um, the Second Amendment sanctuary amendment would run into August. So why the ordinance needs to run several months past that? Chair Bernie, uh, Commissioner Trigger, it's because this the the last event that could be impacted by this ordinance is the election. And that's why it's the day after the election, the last election that it could apply to. I see. Um, and a, and a follow-up question, if you know, do the, do pet petitions, do their, does their validity expire? I mean, they have two months to gather, but is there a duration in which they have to submit the petitions after the, that period expires? Um, Chair Bernie, uh, Commissioner Trigger, yes. So they have to, in other words, the signatures do not, um, they, they work for a limited period of time for a specific election, they're not indefinite. In other words, you can't collect signatures for like two, three, four years. So these, all we've done with this is extend what would ordinarily be the, if you will, expiration date for them. I understand, it doesn't quite answer. My question is once the two years are up and you've collected signatures, can how long can you hold those sheets and have them remain valid? Or is the answer you can't basically? You can't, I mean, that in ordinary circumstances, they're only good, you only have two years to, to collect them and then it's the next election, if that makes sense, that you can use them for, you can't hold them for two and a half years or three years and use them. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. Are there any question, other questions or comments for Mr. Gingle on this item? Um, seeing none, this was a discussion item, correct, Mr. Dingle? Yes, it is. I just, I will now, based upon the fact that there's no additional input, I'll uh, finalize the form of it and work with the agenda team to schedule, put it on the uh, agenda for a first reading. Very good. Thank you. Right. Yes. And then we have uh, the final item under County Council, discussion about the process for redistricting, given the right. changes that we've all been uh, having to work under. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Bernie, members of the uh, Board of Commissioners. I will be forwarding to you later today or tomorrow, um, <clears throat> just as a general overview on this topic. We've received some really good uh, information about training from the U.S. Bureau of Census. I've been in communication with their person, and I've com confirmed that all of these different aspects of redistricting and the census data and everything that's available mm -hmm. is being recorded and will be available um, 30 days after the presentation to anyone who wants to access the library. And I'm immediately thinking of our, of our redistricting committee. It would be an excellent uh, resource for them to do. They don't have to do it together as a group. And it's something that they can do before they, obviously it's productive time that they could spend uh, before they actually get the census data. And I also thought that the board might find some of these various topics um, to be interesting or informative. So I will forward that email along uh, uh, sometime today or tomorrow. With regard to the specific issues that are in front of you today, I want to make sure, uh, I know there was one email I think per, the, the, the person uh, understood very well. We're going to, my recommendation very strongly is to run these two ordinances parallel to each other so that it's very clear in the public's minds what's going on. And, and to recap, what we're doing is the first one of these ordinances is to comply with our mandate that's in our charter that the redistricting occur not less than every 10 years, which we're not going to be able, we've, I think everyone understands and the board agrees, is, is impossible to do this year because of the pandemic, because we're not expected to receive, well, the state's not expected to receive the census data until September 30th, and we'd have to do, complete our redistricting process by October 26th, which everyone agrees is impossible. So that first ordinance is the is uh, confirms the route that the poor board decided to go, where essentially uh, we will reconfirm the lines that were drawn in 2011. But I think it's critical, you'll notice that in that ordinance, there's a lot of cross-reference to the other ordinance involving the redistricting committee that will actually complete, complete that work. And the reason I think it's important that they run parallel is so that the public understands those two things to go together, they're joined. Uh, there is there is not going to just be a you know adoption of, a permanent adoption of the the lines drawn in 2011, but there's the clear expectation of the entire board that there's going to be a complete uh, redistricting process as is anticipated by the uh, charter. It'll just be done at a later time because of the lateness of the uh, data 
census data. So the first, uh, and again, what I'm going to do is same, basically the same sort of process. I want to confirm with both of these ordinances. Uh, we have run them through the uh, Lane County equity lens. I'll make some comments about the redistricting one in a moment. But the first one is, is fine. And what I'd like to do is make sure, again, if there's any additional input uh, that any board member has, uh, I'll take that at this point. And what I'd like to, hopefully what I'm going to come out of here today with is the final version uh, for the first reading for both of these ordinances, which I'll also schedule with the agenda team. But that's my, that's my goal and my hope. So to keep these two kind of separate, I'll ask the question, same question that I asked about the last one, which is the one that is um, the simply the placeholder, uh, keeping the lines as previously drawn so that we comply with the uh, charter mandate. Uh, do, are there any questions or additions or suggestions for that particular um, ordinance? Uh, yes, I see the commissioner tree here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. The only piece I have a question or a concern about is uh, in the now therefore number two, it seems to me the way it's worded could potentially leave it a little more open-ended than I would like to see us um, have it. I'd like to be a little more explicit with a timeline. And I wonder if it doesn't make sense and it's opening this up for consideration to connect it to um, the state, the state completing their process. So having it say something about within a certain yay many months of the state completing their process or something, because otherwise the way it's stated now, um, it, it puts no guardrails of timing on us to um, to complete a, a new process. Uh, Chair Bernie, Commissioner Trigger, we could certainly do that. Um, it would be, I mean, you'd have to decide, I guess, with on what that 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 amount of time is within. And I guess with um, the other the other thing we'd have to do is be really clear about what it is the state is going to do. That triggers it. Is it receiving the data? Is it is the is it the legislature adopting the new boundary? I mean, that's that's the other part of that that would leave that very open ended because, as we all know, this it could literally be years before the legislature redraws lines. So that that'd be fine. Um, I think it would be. I think if from my perspective, I would recommend something that is very objective and that is very easy to, to look at. And it might be within so many months of the state receiving the, um, you know, the Census Bureau data, because that's very easy to, that's a date we can all go back and look at. If, you know, I'm sure there'll be with much, I'm sure that the state will send out an email or the Census Bureau will send out an email saying that they delivered it. And then it's just a matter of you picking how long you think that's going to take. Commissioner, I see your head shaking. Does that satisfy the intent of your question? It does, thank you. Yeah, I really was opening it up sort of for conversation and my main concern, as I said, was just putting some kind of parameters on it and not have it be so open-ended and, and tying it to the census data, but opening it up for conversation, thank you. Um, I'm gonna call on other commissioners and you're invited to speak to what your points was and, and you're invited to respond to Commissioner Krieger's point. Um, Commissioner, Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. In um, in response to Commissioner Trigger's comment, it does kind of say that we we do this, but we could do it five years from now, um, and that's not our intent. Uh, the question I have is if it's possible to say we would do this within six months of getting the census data. Can we do that? even if the state has not finalized their process. Hopefully they have, but you just never know. And I have one other comment. On the, actually, it's on the second part, so I can wait on that if we want to finish yeah, this part. Chair Brady Commissioner uh, Buck, I think Ms. Williams, are you on this? I know, I know she was involved in- um, She is. In the last, the last round of it. I think she's probably the best person to give us a, an idea. I wasn't here about how long after we received the information from the state it took for that group to come up with the maps and, and the boundaries. So I'll, I'll defer to Ms. Williams if she could uh, answer your question. Uh, Chair Bernie, uh, Commissioner Trigger, this is Judy. 
I would have to go back and, and look, but just to give kind of an estimate, I know we were working on establishing that group uh, right away from the beginning. And so as much as we could get some information to that group and just, you know, share information as we were getting it, um, we were kind of ready to go once we got the go ahead. And so as much as we could uh, prepare, the better. Um, I don't have too much other specific recollection at this time, but I can uh, look into that for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, did you want to add to that before Commissioner Buck continues? Steve? I, I was just going to say, I don't think there's any, I think it's really just the practical um, uh, realities of doing it as opposed to, if I understand Commissioner Buck, a, a legal prerequisite. I mean, we could, uh, for lack of a better word, plow ahead on our own. I think it's just been uh, everybody wants to do it in conjunction with the other types of lines that are being drawn. So it's sort of de facto, we're, we're trailing behind the state, if that makes sense. Well, that makes perfect sense. And, and if we had been on a regular timeline, we would have gotten this information by the end of last year, December 31st, normally. And our deadline technically is October 26th, though that's nearly a year later that we generally would finalize what we've been doing, six months that I mentioned before might be a little tight. Mm -hmm. And again, I, to Ms. Williams' point, I want to emphasize, I really do want us, or I really would like the board to create this thing because I do think that there is a lot of work that this committee can do to get ready before they ever receive the census data so that they literally are ready to hit the ground running. So you could certainly say within, um, 12 months from the state's receipt of the census data, uh, that number, uh, the number two under the, the ordained could be changed to reflect that. That certainly seems reasonable. That would be, seems like that's consistent with the amount of time that it took last time. And I understand that there's an expectation that it might be a little bit more efficient because of the increase in technology. There may be less lag. I believe Commissioner Bozovich mentioned that it's you know, instead of waiting perhaps days to, to figure out what a particular boundary might do, that theoretically is almost going to happen instantaneously. So I think there will be some efficiencies achieved that way. So it seems like a year should be good. And, and remember, this is an ordinance. So if at some point the need arose to extend that time period, you could simply pass another ordinance. And there would, of course, the public would have an opportunity to have input on that. And, Presumably, it would be a very short extension if you needed it. It would be something along the lines, but I expect something like 30 or 60 days. Okay. If they're, if they're Wait, but would you have um, another point you wanted to make? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you. Um, as somebody that's up, you know, my term ends in 22, um, and would, that's when I'd have to be running. If we're talking six months from September 30th, that puts you past the filing deadline mm. for, for the May, May 22 election. Um, so the urgency is even more than that, um, uh, Commissioner Traeger. Uh, we need to go ahead and, and in parallel to this, as, as uh, County Council mentioned, get the committee um, appointed, trained in, um, you know, what the legal things are behind districts and, and, and all the various uh, requirements needed, select a software provider for um, doing the, the actual uh, drawing of lines and getting data back out. Um, there's multiple multiples out there now. Um, uh, moon shadow last time was the only um, really uh, non GIS driven software available time last 10 years ago. Now there's multiple uh, providers that provide uh, very similar, almost instantaneous, you know, draw a polygon and you know uh, how many people are in that polygon and even everything about the demographics that goes with that comes along with the census data. If the committee is appointed, trained, and software is ready to go, 
it should take less than two months for the committee to have maps for the commissioners. I mean, that's basically what it took in 2010 was just a couple months. And that was with soft, you know, with software and other issues where they're bouncing back and forth between LCOG software and the Moonshadow software. So there was significant delays sometimes in, in even alternatives then. Um, so I, 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 I agree with Commissioner Trigger that there is an urgency. I, I'm a little reluctant to, to put six months on that because I think six months is too long. Um, but also if we put a deadline on that and for some reason the federal government doesn't get data uh, to the state until the end of December of this year, there's no way we're going to have districts ready for the for the 22 elections. We're going to have to make a decision about do we wait to adjust maps till post election year? You know, so that that's a whole nother discussion we're going to have to have. But um, I, 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 I do agree that there is an urgency with this um, that needs to be carried out because we do have elections that are going to these districts will impact coming up next year. And frankly, folks started filing for those elections in, you know, October, setting up committees and all that in October, the year before the May election. So we're we're going to be, you know, <laughs> changing districts as people are thinking about, you know, filing committees and raising funds, um, and they don't know if they're going to actually be in the district they're raising funds for. So um, I I don't know how we deal with that uh, in trying to change that second now therefore to account for that, but I think we as a board need to commit to moving the independent committee process ahead, getting it appointed and trained prior to the, any release of data to the state. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, if I may, um, Commissioner Bozovich, I heard you say you agreed to something I didn't hear. So I just want to clarify from Commissioner Trigger. Commissioner Trigger, were you talking about a sense of urgency or um, asking for accountability and more specificity? Thank you, Chair. Um, if I had to pick between those two options, I would say more the latter. Um, and again, I was opening this for a conversation. Um, perhaps there's language to put in place about how the timing of the adoption or the effect of the maps would take place based on if there's already an election cycle underway so that we don't do a thing like have someone when we're, you know, if it's within a certain amount of time of an election that they don't become adopted until a certain amount of time after that. Or I, I'm, I'm open to thinking this through. My, my essential point was I was not comfortable with the language being as open-ended as it was and not being tied to any kind of data around when we'll receive the data that we need, that this committee will need to have to do their job. Thank you, and Commissioner Bozovich, I hope you didn't mind. I was just looking for clarification. Are, are there any other commissioners that would like to weigh in? Commissioner, Commissioner Farr. Thank you. I'm waiting very little. I've, I've been largely silent throughout the discussion on redistricting because I believe we uh, will have a process in place that will be fair. And the most important thing that people need to know is that uh, it's what the redistricting takes into account and that they understand the process that went into it. I think we're ensuring that throughout this uh, extended debate that we're having. As far as timelines are concerned, um, I believe that there can be um, accuracy and urgency at the same time. And I, I look in Mr. Dingle's office and I, I think that uh, council understands the, uh, the balance there, that uh, we can get things done on time. We still can be very, very accurate and uh, precise in what we're doing. I have a great deal of confidence in the, uh, in the, final, um, in the final product that, we're, that we'll produce. Um, and I think that uh, the most important thing is that people do but trust the system and that people do in fact know which district that they are in ultimately and that they feel that it's fair. I think that the more that we as a board in 2021 wordsmith this, the more that will be to revise for future boards. So the, the simpler that we can make this ordinance, the better we are um, in terms of uh, in terms of adherence for the for the future. I can you know I can see if we put too many words in there 10, 12, 20 years from now, they'll be saying, well, why did they put all these words in? That's not accurate today. So, you know, keeping it as simple as possible while being fair and, under and understandable to the general public. I have confidence that's going to happen. Thank you, Chair. 
<laughs> Chair Bernie, if I may, I, I did want to mention one other thing. The, the, um, the charter requires that the boundary subsection uh, E of the uh, of chapter three requires that the district boundaries shall be finally adopted at least six months prior to any election for which they are to be effective. So there is that, and that's in our charter again, which we which the board can't change by ordinance. And I know that that pro, I'm, I'm working backward from uh, the point that uh, Commissioner Bozovich made, which is if you you were talking about the May election and working backwards, you're into December. I think if you do it right, if you do it straight 180 days. Um, I mean, part of the, again, part of the concern or part of the difficulty, of course, is just the uncertainty of knowing when this is going to happen. I know that the Census Bureau said they were going to, you know, provide it on September 30th, but we're completely at their mercy. As, as Commissioner Bozovich mentioned, it could be, you know, <laughs> October, November, December, January. I mean, we're, you know, we're, um, maybe the compromise is September, October, November, December. Maybe we, you know, maybe we do put a short, the board puts a short string on it and makes it four months to provide that sense of urgency. Um, again, that's going to impact obviously the, the committee because they're probably gonna have to meet obviously more frequently if they have to get it done in four months if they had six months or seven months to do it. But presumably we're going to be, uh, and, I, and, I, and I guess that's the other point is, this is pretty important because it will be a part of our uh the discussion on the next matter because we're gonna have to put all this information in the application so folks understand what they're you know what they're putting in for and what they're committing to and if it's a a short a shorter time frame means a a, a longer or a greater time commitment during that period of time if, if you're going to serve on it commissioner bozovich you know a lot of this relates to this the sense of urgency you brought up did you want to make any comments uh, on what Councilor just identified. Yeah, and and, and you're, also, and you're also the only person that has sat through this before. So please, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, to add to that, um, yeah, we held two two public hearings on on adopting the 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 past uh, districts and and uh, had to do first readings ahead of that. So that was approximately a one month from, you know the committee ending work to when we actually adopted the districts. So if you kind of work back from a May election to six months before that, you're in the middle of December to where we'll have to actually have a first reading in November. And we're talking about. Uh, if I may, 30th. point of clarification, no, you would be in the middle of November, not December. Yeah. Did I, did I say first reading in November? No, you That's said. What? Yeah, I thought I said November, sorry. Uh, but yeah, first reading, middle of November. So you're basically a month and a half from census data being released to maps to the commissioners. Just, you know, that's that's the urgency I'm feeling. I'm really hopeful that the, the, the federal government makes that end of September deadline. Uh, I don't foresee them pushing it again. Um, there, you know, there's so much pushback that they're they're that late going to be that late to start with, um, you know, from across the U.S. Uh, I so I, I I hope we can get it in September, and then uh, you know, just knowing that um, having the committee ready and ready to meet at least um, you know three or four times in the course of a month of October. Um, is going to be part of what they should be prepared for if we're going to try and have districts ready for the 22 cycle. Thank you. Commissioner Buck. Thank you, Chair. You know, the incident I heard that the census was being pushed out to September 30th, um, I basically knew that we were probably not going to make any changes in time for the May election cycle. I mean, it, it, we, <clears throat> I really feel strongly that we need to make sure that when we do do redistricting, we do it accurately. 
and make sure the committee has the time in which to do it rather than trying to beat our own election recycle dates. So if it takes extra time and it doesn't go into effect until November, it is what it is. If we can do it sooner, great. But I do want to just make the point that the public is going to be watching this very diligently, not only here, but all over the nation. And I wanna make sure that we give them enough time to do it uh, accurately and then to fully consider the ramifications on the board as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Chair Bernie. Just one last note from me, and that is uh, regarding where I get my level of confidence that we're going to do this right. I've been through two redistrictings um, with this, both with the city of Eugene. The first was a massive list that could have been very left that could have been very controversial. There were huge redistricting lines drawn during that first redistricting. And because it was uh, deliberative and the public was involved and it was wide open, there was very little controversy. In fact, one of the, one of the councilors at that point um, uh, agreed to him no longer living in his district after the new lines were drawn. It, was, uh, it became that obvious and non-controversial. The second redistricting with the city required very little adjustment because of that heavy lift that had already taken place. And so most redistricting is going to be very minor around the edges adjustments. And uh, that's what gives me the confidence for the future that we're, what we're doing today uh, does not necessarily require a heavy lift. It may in fact be adjustments around the edges, but ultimately it's going to make it uh, easier for future commissions, for future boards to, uh, to make relatively small adjustments and make it a relatively easy process to go through in a very public fashion. That's where my confidence comes from. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I noticed that both uh, Greg Rickoff and Cheryl Betchart are with us. Before I make any concluding comments, did either of you want to join in the discussion? No? Okay, sure. I do. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my camera for some reason. Um, yep. Chair Bernie, Commissioner, the, let me. We, we can hear you loud and clear whether okay. we can see you flat okay. enough or not. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I just wanted to mention that once the committee completes its work and the requirements for adoption are with you, then at that point, our work begins here at Lane County Elections. We have to work with our GIS team to digitize all of the address changes that have occurred as a result of the new lines being drawn. And it's our preference always that we stay as close to the precinct lines that are currently in place. We have 80 precincts. Those currently match up to our state lines as well as to the commissioner lines. So the more that you deviate from those existing lines, and we know there will be deviations for sure, but the more that they're redrawn and deviated, then it requires addressing changes here at the county level, which in turn impacts what a voter sees on their ballot. So we also have to look at city lines, school lines, fire lines, park lines. So all of that work for addressing changes as a result of what you adopted occurs after your adoption timeline. So for us, it's a very intense work that requires extreme accuracy. So whatever the timelines are, I would like to be sure that that is considered and that from the county clerk's perspective that I would like to encourage and support trying to have the lines be as close as possible to our existing precinct lines. So that is a huge um, undertaking for us at this office. So just wanted to let you, to make sure you were aware of that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bedchart, for integrating pragmatic reality into this discussion. Um, Mr. Dingle, did you want to say one other thing? Yes, Chair Brady, if I could. I, Ms. Williams found the calendar uh, from the last um, redistricting. So just, just as a point of comparison, the first meeting of the group was, uh, was July 28th. Uh, the next meeting was August 9th. They had some training with Moonshadow on August 18th. They had their third meeting on August 19th. They had their fourth meeting on August 25th. 
They have their fifth meeting on September 1st, their sixth meeting on September 7th. On September 27th, they presented the scenarios to the BCC. On October 5th, they had an, I guess they presented it again. On October 12th was the first reading of the ordinance. And then October, or excuse me, September 12th, and then September 26th, the uh, it was uh, adopted. So just to give you some sort of idea about how much time they spent. So essentially it was. Um, Mr. Dingle, I don't think we're, I thank you. <laughs> you just wanted to point out how many months the process took? Yes. How many months was it? How many months was that, sir? It was about three, I guess. Okay. It's August, September. Well, actually, where they worked, it was really odd, two months, a little over two months. First meeting oh. was at the end of July, and they turned it over uh, at the end of September. Um, I, I would like to have an opportunity to speak here. I could not agree more with Commissioner Buck's points, and let me put them in my words, at least. I'll, I'll try and put in my words and make it my own as they do in the voice. <laughs> um, one, if we're gonna do this, we should do it right and it should not be defined by time. It should be defined by whatever the process takes so that people are satisfied with a transparent result, number one. And number two, um, optics, and realities are important. And as it relates to having a time frame constrained by when one or more of us may be running for office is absolutely the worst optics. That that is that 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 will suggest that there's a vested interest in the results. And I think everyone here has had multiple discussions saying no, what we don't want. Um, that reality, much less it to look that way. So on a personal level, as I was reviewing um, how lines were redrawn, hey, I'd love it to go back to where it was before the last redrafting, but that's self-interest. And there is, there should be no self-interest amongst commissioners here. So for whatever it's worth, um, we are in this position because of some clusters that are related to politicizing census data in the first place. And I think we have to live with that and we have to do this right. And we have to make sure that the integrity of this group that we are going to create um, remains the same remains. And um, I don't see, I don't see a sense of urgency as much as a sense of wanting to do it right. That's just my two cents, especially as I heard what Ms. Betchard said. Would any commissioners like to make any other points? We actually have time before we move on to the next agenda item. And of course, before we're through, I will, as I always do, ask Mr. Dingle if he has what he needs. Yes, Commissioner Buck. I have a concern about the second portion of this. It sounds like we've we've worked through the first part pretty good but the second part is um the actual language on the redistricting committee um for the most part it looks uh really good based on all the feedback that we've given i did want to ask if uh on item 4c which is the duties of the commission it specifically says the proposals that they provide the board must be ranked. And we did discuss this earlier. My concern with the word must rather than may is what if they don't agree? Or what if one proposal looks better from a geographic standpoint, but another proposal may have the um, more even distribution of population per district? Um, so I'm hesitant on the word must, although it would be preferable, um, just based on those two potential possibilities. I'm very interested in what everybody else uh, thinks on that subject. 
Commissioners? Commissioner Bozovich? Um, yeah, I, I hate the term must anyway. I prefer shall. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I, I think the idea of having a ranked is, and, and we have an odd number on the commission, um, the purpose of that is so they actually give us a preference of what's more important, population balance or a geographic boundary. And there's some sense from them about what they felt of those two things, those two competing interests are just just as much as keeping communities of interest together, which might be why they would unbalance population and follow a geographic boundary, such as a city limit um, to keep a community of interest together. Um, so I, I am reluctant to remove that language um, because as they present to the board, they can describe what their discussion was as to why they chose one, you know, this is their number one, this is their number two, and this is their number three. So we we have that input from them. I think it's, it's a way of getting and, and pulling that input uh, from them. Um, and just to go back to the last item, I only brought up the timeline relative to elections because the, the, the six months would have put us in a position where we've been changing districts within six months of an election. I haven't even made my mind up if I'm running for re-election yet. So uh, this has nothing to do with my election term. I agree that we need to have a clear uh, and transparent process. It's one of the reasons why I push so hard for independent uh, committee. And I think that that's, that process in itself is going to do a lot to, to make people comfortable. Um, whether that happens over two months or a year, um, we can make that transparent in either either version of that. But I just wanted to make that clear that the urgency was just more about you know what was initially discussed in changing that that second therefore would have actually put us in violation of election law, and, and that's that's kind of where I was trying to get at. Um, so, but as far as the this particular item goes, I, I support keeping a shall in that sentence. <laughs> Commission, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Trigger. Thank you, Chair. I wonder if, um, as I'm anticipating being faced with choosing from options, really what we want from this committee is an explanation of the relative merits of each option, because they're all going to be relative to one another. So even taking it out of any um, ranking or saying, pluses and minuses or strengths and weaknesses is just here's the ones that we came up with and and why what the what the relative um, merits are of each and then ultimately again it's up to the commissioners to choose because I do um, I certainly think if we're going to leave it with any kind of ranking shall is um, is preferable language to must but even taking out a, a notion that the committee is charged with ranking that that will be our job because by definition the one we choose and ultimately vote on is the one we ranked as the first choice. So I think we could even just recast, I would I would advocate just recasting the language there to say an explanatory statement, which is what they will do as they present them um, anyway. So personally, that's that's where I feel on that. But if we want a statement um, that they will rank them, then I agree shall is, is a, by far a preference language to must. Yeah, yes, my Vice Chair Farr. I'll just say that, that, you know, looking at it from a consumer point of view, which is, uh, you know, my, my history of my life, I'm a retailer. So I always, well, what does the user think about this? Uh, what is, you know, the end user and the people who are voting, there are things that just make sense and don't make sense. Does it make sense that Sheldon High School is in Springfield? No. Does it make sense that Shed is with the University of Oregon? No. Fix things that don't make sense. And then uh, the adjustments around the edges are relatively easy to, easy to handle. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there any further discussion on this item? Commissioner Trigger. Thank you, Chair. By this item, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping what you mean is this section of the, the second ordinance around the process rather than that particular uh, point. No, I, I mean anything related to um, 7C on our agenda before. Great. And, yes. Yeah, thank you. Then um, just going to the selection criteria 
um, I think there's still, I'm not sure, uh, maybe Mr. Dingle, you could tell us where we are in the process of this, but um, there's some of the language in item uh, 3B, Roman numeral two, uh, excuse me, one, about the process for selecting basically to ensure um, diverse representation and, and what information will be redacted and so on. And so if this is still going through another iteration and our um, internal equity committee can take a look um, because there's some language in that section, I appreciate you're taking another run at it and it's a lot closer, but I think we could do better and also be clearer about the specificity of what information will be redacted and, and, and what won't in that section. And so I don't know that this is the time or place to dive into that level of detail, but wanted to call out that for me, that section still needs um, a little bit of work before I'm comfortable with it. Yeah. Uh, Chair Bernie, Commissioner Trigger, yeah, we, I, we kind of jumped ahead, <laughs> I was going to say, from the other one, which was, I do need some direction about what that, that number is that you want to put in there. Um, and I just point out, it, it, and now I'm referring to the earlier one, you've got that default position that's in the, um, that's in the charter that, you know, if we don't have a new, if there's not new boundaries within more than six months ahead of that, the new, then the old boundaries would control the, the, May, um, the May elections. Um, yes, moving on to this one, uh, I, I did. Mr. Dangle, I apologize. If those I'm sorry, if those boundaries controlled the May primary election, would they also, by definition, control the November general election? Yes, yes, yes okay. Chair Thank you. Uh, moving on to this other one, I did uh, this. We did, uh, Mr. Rickoff, Ms. Young, and I uh, discussed the the equity lens here. And to your point, Mr. Trigger, they did. I did Ms. Young sent me some language that um, I think addresses your concern in terms of the description and whatnot that I was going to add into that. I was going to use that language as opposed to the one that, which was just drawn from the, using the terms and the language that the, the folks who made presentations to the board or commented to the board was. Um, you make a good point I've, uh, in terms of, I think the board has to make a decision about the, um, the, the blind, um, uh, the, the, how the applications are going to be processed. Um, I mean, it's a very clear choice. I mean, you, you either have people identify all of those characteristics that you want or that, that should be, that you want expressed or, or present on the commission. Um, I actually thought that your suggestion, Commissioner Trigger, made a, made a great deal of sense, which was the, which is sort of the compromise position between that, which is, that you, I think you were the one that suggested an essay question that would essentially say, you know, the board wants this committee to reflect and then you'd list all these different values. And then it was an essay question, which was please explain or uh, provide a statement about how your presence on this committee would contribute to that diversity. Um, that's really a call for the, that's really a call for the board. Um, I guess the other choice you have is whether or not uh, you want to include that in the ordinance itself, as opposed to uh, making you know statements around it at staff. I'm I'm a little the board can obviously it's the board's will. I really would not recommend that we start getting down into you know I don't want an ordinance that's seven pages long where we talk about you know whatever. I think my belief is that it's been publicly expressed very clearly. I think the once the board makes that. Uh, decision staff can carry it out. I know that Commissioner Bernie, for example, we talked about the how folks would be notified of this, and I think everyone, uh, all the board is on, understands that I'm going to use the list that we used with all of those diverse groups that we sent the um, the request for public comment to. In addition to every single individual who has sent an email offering uh, a thought or a comment on on this. And so again, I don't think we have to go down to that level of detail in the ordinance. I think if there's an understanding and an expectation that that's going to occur, uh, certainly what I would do is, and again, I'm very acutely aware of the of the history and whatnot that we're making here. This is going to be a very um, a detailed board packet, if you will, because I it's my intention to put all of this, all of the things that we're discussing right now into the board packet that will accompany the ordinance. We'll talk about your listening sessions. We'll, I may even include the email list as an exhibit to show all of the, you know, the groups that it was sent to. Uh, I'll try and encapsulate those comments that were made uh, on the conversations that the board had at different points about its desire 
for blind applications and the notification process. So um, that's my that's my suggestion. But again, it's the board's will. So if you just let me know, I'll go back and redraft this. I know we I know we don't have a total sense of urgency, but I really would like to um, try and get this done. Quite frankly, before you start getting involved in the budget process, so it would certainly be nice to have the ordinance adopted and the selection, you know, the the the, the process rolling, if you will, the applications being sent out, the notifications being made, so that those committee members could be start being identified and that process could be uh, completed. It would be terrific, I think, if if you could have the committee in place uh, before the end of the fiscal year, which would give them some time over the summer to do those things we talked, you know, the talk we talked about, watch those videos, get the training, as I mentioned in that calendar, you notice there were two or three different trainings about the software that the group received, you know, that's that they have to do too. So it'd be wonderful if all that was done. And so come September 30th, they were literally ready at the ground running. Thank you very much, Councillor. Further discussion. I see none. Um, Mr. Dingle, do you have what you need to bring this back? Um, I, I believe I do for the for the second one, the redist redistricting committee. Um, I still would. I, I think the one thing that's missing on the um, the first one is that that number within so many. I think there was agreement. Seem to be consensus on the board that the triggering event was the delivery of the data to the state of Oregon. Uh, it didn't. What and again, understanding that there's that six month default position, I just need to know where the board landed in the interim, if you will. Thank you, Commissioner Buck. <clears throat> I would say <clears throat> that it should be no later than a year, but we all have the urgency here to try to do it sooner. I think that gives plenty of time, especially if there's another wrinkle um, that happens that we have no control over uh, at the state level. I'm thinking more specifically because we don't know how they're going to roll that out. Uh, and if we get it done earlier, great. So, uh, Chair Rooney, Commissioner Buck, you are proposing that it would be that that therefore would read not less, not later than 12 months after the uh, state of Oregon receives its the, the current census uh, data from the United States Census Bureau. Is that what you're saying? Got it. Very good. With that, Chair Rooney, I think I do have everything that I need and my I will get these. Um, the next time you see these, it's my fervent hope and desire that they will be in the specific final version of what it would look, you know, ordinance language so that it would be, the next step would be to set up for a first reading. Well, Councillor, your fervency is noted. <laughs> um, are there any other comments bef uh, before uh, the Councillor moves to do the work required? Very good. Hey, Steve, thank you very much for, for all your time on this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So we have a choice. Um, it's been indicated to me that while we have another hour, we absolutely have to break at 1130. But uh, it's also I've also heard from Ms. Williams that if it was the desire of the group, uh, her and Sarai Johnson would be ready to present um, item 11A which would be discussion on, on the quarterly update on the Affordable Housing Action Plan. That's a 45-minute item. What's the will of the board? Uh, it looks to me like the will of the board is do it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Ms. Williams, you offered. Therefore, I presume you are fleet of foot. Sarai is ready, and we're ready to look at um, item 11. County administration, a up quarterly update on the affordable housing plan. Good morning, uh, chair and commissioners. And I hesitate because I, um, I Sarai is not able to get in and I'm um, 
she's invited to the afternoon session. And so I've been trying to get her invited to this morning session. And as I'm logged in as Diana, I'm unable to. Um, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I know I did offer that and I've been trying to get her in to try and get us some time on the agenda. And I am not as coordinated as Diana, but I'm still trying. Do, um, well, before I respond to you, it looks like Commissioner Trigger would like to respond. <laughs> sure, I just, I just wonder if just taking a five minute recess to give time to try to troubleshoot that is, is in order or if I, I leave that to Ms. Williams and you, but it's just a, a middle ground thought. Judy, that's a question to you. Chair Bernie, Commissioner Trigger, I would hope that in five minutes that should be able to be figured out. Um, and then I just, oh, all right, popped in. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're, we're working with what we have. It looks like um, we're making it work. So perfect. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarai, for joining us. Do we want to go ahead and get going? Okay. I'm ready if you are. Okay. I oh, will. So do you know? Oh, do you know if you can make it so I can share my screen, Judy? Absolutely do that. First off, I would just like commissioners to know how fleet of foot this staff is. It says Greg Rickoff, but I know that that's Sarai Johnson. And Judy Wilton is, in fact, uh, doing this in lightning speed. So thank you all for bearing with it. And it looks like we are prepared to uh, now discuss item 11A. And uh, Judy Williams, Sarai Johnson, please take it away. Thank you. Oh, pardon me while I pull up the correct PowerPoint. Here it comes, it's happening. We got this. Pardon how dark it is in here. Um, I'm moving my room around as you can see, but <laughs> so enjoy. On our screen, we have two affordable housing action plan screens open. There you go. Yay. All right. Well, thank you. Commission, uh, Chair Bernie and commissioners for having us this afternoon. Um, I believe I'm going to get this party started with the beginning of our presentation and then we'll move. Uh, we'll, Judy and I will switch off. So also Judy. Oh, why is it playing all by itself? Um, let me know if you need me to slow down or stop or when it's your turn. <laughs> um, Judy, Judy and I have been working together to start up our team um, to implement the affordable housing action plan that uh, the Board of Commissioners adopted. La I'm so sorry, I don't know why on earth. That's so weird. Um, anyway, the, that, uh, the, count the Board of Commissioners had adopted um, in December. And so uh, I wanted, we, we are ready to do the, our very first update on that. Uh, and oh my goodness, this presentation has a mind of its own and is literally playing itself. So Pardon me while I correct that technical difficulty. Maybe Judy, do you want to just dive in with kind of our, our first, hey, here's what's going on piece and then I'll fix this. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Sarai. And thanks for um, hanging in there with us as we get this started. Uh, Chair Bernie, commissioners, uh, we're really excited to come to you and present this topic. Um, as Sarai mentioned, uh, you know, in December is when we adopted the action plan. Um, through a great effort with our consultant, Better Housing Together. Um, they were really very uh, super helpful in terms of getting us an action plan that was very specific and really served as a roadmap as we're guiding um, efforts into addressing this crisis. Um, just let me know, sir, if you want to pop in. But um, I think just, you know, the, this quote really kind of stood out for us when we were putting this this uh, this work together. You know, knowing how much of the crisis this is and, and all of you are, are working in this arena and you, you know as well, just, you know, trying to address this as, this really is like a once in a century crisis, which means, you know, on the flip side, this is a once in a century opportunity for real structural change as it relates to housing. 
Um, so what do you do when, um, when you're asked, when you're given that opportunity and how big do you dream? Uh, and Soraya was mentioning, you know, we are co-leading this effort and um, excited to kick it off and really get into the weeds in terms of uh, what progress we've been making, what's to come and um, do this quarterly update as we move along. Yay, thank you, Judy. And uh, again, thank you, commissioners. Um, it is true, as Judy mentioned, we are facing a, a major crisis around housing. Um, of course, that trickles all the way down into um, so many people in our community uh, experiencing homelessness and unsheltered homelessness. And it also trickles back up to the working class and middle class of our community um, as housing continues to become more and more expensive. Um, it moves further out of reach for folks who are interested in home ownership. But of course, also um, on the rental market side is um, overwhelmingly expensive with our housing prices increasing really significantly over the last several years, um, really last decade at least and beyond. So today we're going to go through a, a review of the action plan. We'll introduce you to the team um, that we've pulled together internally to work through these um, recommendations that were provided by Better Housing Together. We will con uh, connect about the vision and key principles that guide this work. Um, and then we'll talk about how we're integrating into the work plans and um, update on metrics. We'll discuss a financial update. We most likely are looking primarily for your direction and thoughts about what you'd like to see in future reports as this is going to be a quarterly item on board agendas. The action plan, as you recall, has five different sections of recommendations, and that came from a research and analysis of our local needs, engagement with our partners in the community, um, and then identifying strategies that could help meet the different needs in our housing market, um, and then a housing affordability framework. So the five recommendation sort of categories are leveraging land, um, piloting and partnering, with uh, different groups and, and trades, uh, supporting trades by creating more career ladders and other, other items, and then rural innovation and building capacity. Uh, we'll go into more detail on each of these as we continue on. Uh, but first, we'd like to introduce you to the team of folks who are working on this. So we've pulled people from a variety of locations in the county. Uh, Danielle Batista from the Human Services Division is a Program Services Coordinator. Alyssa Baz is the Assistant Building Official. Um, Jenna Cusimano and Austin, along with, um, are all both from Community Economic Development and serving on this team. We have Lindsay Eichner. Um, planner, Sean Waite, um, facilities, and then Judy and myself as well. Oh, and Laurel O'Rourke, um, who just recently joined the community economic development team as well, um, but has a, a rich and deep background in human services. So the goal of this group is to steer Lane County toward implementing the Affordable Housing Action Plan. And we pulled these folks together because they have knowledge and experience with different uh, parts and pieces of these recommendations. And we have three primary guiding principles. And the first is equity and inclusion. Um, so we intend to use an equity lens on all of the work that we do. So focusing on racial equity, um, class, making sure that rural and urban communities are equally addressed as needed, um, that we're including people's voices who have lived experience. Uh, we're also working within a collective impact framework and intention. Um, looking to collaborate with stakeholders and sectors, um, and then use data for decision making and accountability. Um, bold action is another part of our principles, because as you know, this crisis is major and we want to make sure that we're addressing it in um, bold ways that allow us to explore existing opportunities and maximize those as well as to um, identify new opportunities, both for financing and, and otherwise, um, to build on the creative solutions and ideas that grow out of our community and that have been implemented in, in other communities as well. Um, and this quote is another uh, a very opinionated quote about housing, which um, as, a house, as a board that has adopted a housing first outlook um, is likely somewhat aligned with our approach. It's hard to argue that housing is not a fundamental human need Decent, affordable housing should be a basic right for everybody in this country. The reason is simple. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. Uh, and as you can see, that's not just in individual people's lives, but also for the community, um, as we're experiencing right now with so much unsheltered homelessness. Um, and sorry, I keep bringing up homelessness, but as you know, that's 
where I spend my time. Um, I think I'm handing it off to you now, Judy. Right, so uh, thank you, Sarai. So as we um, are doing these quarterly updates, we'll kind of touch on the five cate action categories as pointed out in our action plan. Um, and as a reminder, the board materials are updated or up on the website too. And attachment A is also, um, if anybody wanted to walk through some of the progress specific to these action items and every strategy, that detail is out there. Um, so the first one on leveraging the land, there's um, a great coordination that's that's underway through um, both Lane County and some groups that one of that Soraya is on and several others, and also working with the city of Eugene in collaboration with trying to find land options and have uh, great partnerships as well. So some of those specific strategies are really geared at identifying public lands that are suitable for housing and shelter expand our land banking program and address the first right of a refusal on tax foreclosure. So great progress there in terms of a group convening and really looking at every time, you know, prior to items or properties may go to foreclosure, addressing those and having that thorough review ahead of time. Next. Pilots and Partners update um, underway. We are really working on creating that home share uh, option. And so this is uh, fairly um, underway. It's, it's um, in review stage right now in terms of reviewing with our risk management uh, office and reviewing in terms of tax abatement as well. So more to come on that and we'll hope to see some um, forward progress on this as well. And then some of the updated or upcoming items related to pilots and partnerships are, you know, really looking at our, our partnerships for sure, but also working with the those in the faith community and looking at potential options as um, pointed out in the action plan of, of many opportunities to partner and get creative in terms of land that's all uh, that's right now identified as um, a faith community and what we can do to get creative on those sites as well as partnering and doing some pilots with uh, financial institutions i think you know we heard while this this body of work is a living breathing document and we do have very specific action items here we did the team really wanted to incorporate some of the items mentioned um, in December when reviewing this and things like, you know, having that private sector partnership really established and, and explore that um, as well as really exploring those financial institution partnerships as well. And then also looking at um, affordable ADUs to come and we can talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So the next category is in terms of trade support. So a lot of um, exciting programs here that are upcoming but uh, really working on what are some of the potentials with collaborating with uh, our partners, U of O, LCC, looking at those trade programs. What, are we, what can we do to uh, support them, whether it's helping to buy materials or scheduling workshops and really trying to get the information to the community and the building community to learn how to you know, do more smaller scale development and, and what kind of work, workshops can we do as a team um, with the great expertise that we have here in the community. And then also some other projects that are coming up in terms of workshops that might um, address some of the infill opportunities as well. In the next category, rural innovation. Those so were, were um, we do have an existing rare partnership. Um, it's a, a great opportunity in our community economic development program that has uh, been ex extremely helpful. And so we've extended that partnership and extended that opportunity. And 30% of the rare position will be focused on affordable housing. So that is coming up. As well as uh, really exploring a little bit more detail in terms of uh, uh, CLT and land trust opportunities, you know, structures for long term affordability. Um, piloting any rural ADU projects and you know just there's a lot of good 
information and good projects underway in our rural community areas that may be more advanced and, and further along as some of us. And so really just um, looking there and, and to connect and partner and, and help uh, each other out. And then finally on the fifth item, build capacity. Uh, again, this is, as we you know mentioned, this is a living, breathing document and, and we do plan to make updates as needed. But one of the things that we did really uh, push better housing together to give us was some out of the box thinking. And you know, what is it, you know, we can't continue to do the same thing that we've been doing and expect a different outcome. And so we really pushed to get creative, think outside the box, um, look at revenue options. And so this is one item um, exploring TRT, travel transient room tax increments. But we also wanted to just put in here, explore other revenue options as well. Uh, seeding a revolving loan fund, as well as uh, studying a housing leverage fund as well. So those are upcoming projects that we are talking about quite a bit. So right, I'm gonna, or I can take this one if you want, or. Sounds good, thanks Judy. Uh, so we have a few uh, initial metrics that were recommended within the afford, uh, Affordable Housing Action Plan. Uh, one is the number of units by Homes for Good that are produced, um, afford, which of course they do affordable housing and um, that will include PSH, which you'll also get reports on through other mechanisms. Um, we'll also identify the number of affordable housing units by other developers, uh, number of your workforce housing units and number of market rate housing units. At this moment, we don't have number targets attached to those. Um, so at this point, it would really be counting, um, although it could be a thing that we could benchmark if that seems like the best way to go too. So if we were to say we want to shoot for this many, um, that could be a way for us to further develop these metrics. And in addition to this, I'm sure there are additional metrics that we will be able to identify and start to measure um, to use for that accountability that we mentioned earlier in the collective impact section. Um, so ultimately, we'll want to make sure that this is a successful project um, or set of projects that help us to get more housing that's affordable to people of various incomes on the ground. Is this one you, Judy? I forgot who does this slide. Yeah, I can take it. Uh, the, so just a, a financial update we thought would be a, another good option to come bring to you in terms of the quarterly reports. There's a lot of moving pieces right now and a lot of information coming um, our way. You know, what we're really focused on is making sure that we're aware of what those opportunities are and making the most of them. Um, we have been uh, working really hard to, again, stay in touch. And, um, you know, Alex Keller, our Intergovernmental Relations Manager, has been extremely helpful in sharing uh, the information that's coming from both the state and federal uh, government. But we are really, you know, trying to get to this model of, you know, this affordable housing is a priority that's a, identified in our strategic plan. It is what, you know, our, our public had a, a, a strong opinion and put this information in our strategic plan. So this is, you know, when we did that robust effort with our community, affordable housing was one of those top items that the community has wanted. So we try to keep that in mind in terms of this is on our strategic plan, affordable housing is, it, we have an action plan with specific roadmap of where we need to go, what strategies we need to um, address. Uh, we have our principles, our team's principles in terms of, um, you know, having, being bold and being supporting bold actions, really collaborating and using that collective impact approach, as well as an equity lens um, too. So looking at our, our strategic plan, our action plan, principles, and we also have in our action plan, you know, what are those strategies have the most impact? There's the speed of impact and there's a scale of impact. And really trying to focus in on, okay, we have all of this opportunity. Where is where's it going to hit the most? Where can we get the most impact? And so looking at those items and being uh, strategic and um, 
applying and submitting opportunities for funding based on that. And so we have, even as, as late as last Friday evening, um, submitting some applications to the state for um, requests for from the American Rescue Plan Act funding opportunities. So several channels are out there, some from the state, some from you know our own local government, um, more to come in terms of additional guidance. We are still waiting the guidance from the U.S. Department of Treasury in terms of what specifically can be used with those funds, the American Rescue Plan uh, Act funds. But we are taking full opportunity of uh, those opportunities to really, you know, this is one-time money that we can put towards one-time expenses and things like, you know, seeding our revolving loan fund or seeding uh, a home ownership assistance fund. You know, where are some of those ways that we can really uh, gain movement and uh, help our county in terms of the resources that we have as a county and where can we best put those funds moving forward? So um, there's a lot of specific examples and in, in projects that we've been submitting for, but um, just in essence and, and to kind of keep it brief, we are actively monitoring all channels as well as the um, discussion around the infrastructure package and what opportunities may uh, come available there. So there are some potential with uh, a quality of life at home segment of some of that package information. So we're working on it and that's um, an active discussion that we'll continue to have with our team and moving forward, but um, lots of opportunities and it's a great option to be in that situation. So with that, that's the, the end of our um, program, but in terms of either these financial mes metrics or financial updates, if there's anything that you would like to see us present to you moving forward, uh, we really kind of have a, a, an idea and, and like to get your feedback on this structure. So we would like to continue to bring progress updates. You know, where are we at with these five action categories? Um, are there urgent issues that our team has that you'd we'd like you to address, you know, are there um, funding questions? Are there policy questions? We'd like to look at the metrics and really hope to have draft metrics identified at our next quarterly meeting, and then some type of financial metric or financial update and, and to see if that type of information is helpful for you. So with that, um, I will turn it back over to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Judy. I'm reading Diana Jones. I'm looking at Sarah. I'm reading Greg Rickup. So, is there any? Forgive me. Are there any questions, comments? That's a lot of stuff at an exceedingly high level, and I'm sure commissioners would like to dig into it a little bit. Commissioner Bunn. Thank you, Chair. I had a, a few comments um, and questions. First, I just want to appreciate the quote from Matthew Desmond. For those that don't know who Matthew Desmond is, he's an author of the book called Evicted, which was an excellent read. And a, so he's a sociologist that has gone into very, very low income locations and actually lived in them for considerable amounts of time and has a wealth of knowledge uh, from those experiences. So thank you very much for sharing that quote and uh, reminding me of his good work. It's been a while since I've read that book. Um, the other items I wanted to bring up was, um, you had a tab on rural innovation and Specifically, I wanted to point out that we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel on that. Cottage Grove has done a extraordinary amount of work on this in a variety of different kinds of housing styles that are critical for rural communities. And my recommendation would be to figure out how to replicate that in other rural areas around the county and share that with the rest of the state because uh, there isn't there pretty much isn't something that they haven't already tried in the last two years. And almost all of them, I actually can't think of one that hasn't been successful. And it's a variety of different kinds of styles that fit perfectly in small rural locations. So um, my recommendation is, is just how do we replicate that in a nutshell? 
Um, the metrics item that you had brought up, I absolutely want to see the metrics. Um, I actually thought we'd have assigned metrics already and we'd have those numbers in there. A uh, little disappointed that we didn't have that yet. Uh, but, I, but as you consider those metrics and the numbers in which we need to build, I would just urge the count to be realistic. With the TAC report, I don't think the number of units it stated was even close to what we need. I, I didn't feel it's realistic. Um, and so as you pull those metrics together for the next report, if you can explain how you came up with the metrics um, and how even if there are this huge lofty goal, which we know we need a ton of housing, so it probably will be. Um, I just, I want the public to know that what we are looking at is a profound problem and the numbers reflect its need and urgency. Um, and hopefully, I know we kind of bumped you up in the schedule today, so we're a little, little off this morning um and but thank you for being willing to speak to us a little earlier in the day i i would really like to see um some of this move along faster so my question is do we have the option to engage better housing together again for a phase two or additional work on this because we only have so much staff um and you both can only do so many things. And I know you've got a team that will be help working, but they also have their regular jobs too. Um, so how can we help engage the process? Uh, I feel a real sense of urgency and I wanna see us be successful and still get these wins going on a regular basis. Is better housing an option or do you have other plans? Yeah, uh, Chair Bernie and Commissioner Buck, thank you for bringing that up. We, we that is definitely something of, in terms of our conversations at our team level, because there there could be a number of projects or specific areas, and we want to make the most of uh, our consultants' work. But there definitely is room, and we're trying to get that list of what it, what can we realistically do, what can our team do, what could we use some help on. You know, and where is the funding coming from and where are we going in, in that particular moment? But definitely, you know, I think the things that came up at our last conversation about this was, you know, potentially exploring the private sector relationship and, and looking into that a little bit deeper. Uh, but we definitely do have um, an opportunity to continue to collaborate. And I know that they're excited to do that as well. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, Vice Chair Farr. Thank you, Chair Bernie. And uh, uh, very, first, very quickly, Judy, every time I see you associated with a project, it makes me calm. Uh, whether it's parole and probation, whether it's strategic planning, whatever it may be, Judy, uh, when you're working in it, it gives me a sense of calm that uh, I cannot even really actually describe. Um, it doesn't help me escape real reality, however. And so I'm going to look at you. You make presentations to the Human Services Commission, to the Poverty and Homelessness Board, the different committees of the Poverty and Homelessness Board, including Shelter and Supportive Housing. And you are steady and consistent in your approach. You are working on a set of priorities that uh, really are becoming clearer and clearer all the time. But the reality is, Sarai, over the last year, you've not really been able to focus very much on what your original job description was. So it's pretty amazing that you're able to provide any kind of quarterly report uh, based upon the fact that you're not just doing this work, you're, you've been called upon, and rightfully so, and appropriately so, to do many other projects that really are urgent, pressing, and cannot be done any time other than right now, which makes us kind of push some of your priorities down the road a little bit, kick the can, so to speak. Um, and I hope everybody understands that, Sarai, that we don't expect you to, to work miracles during this particular time when you really are stretched thin and you perhaps, and I'll say this frankly, haven't had the full support of the, the double jurisdiction that is uh, that you were originally designed to, re your job was originally re designed to report to. So that being said, I'm just gonna make a statement for each of the county commissions that you're looking at right now. 
uh, myself included, every one of us has repeatedly um, stated our uh, dedication to the work that you're doing. Every one of us has repeatedly, through our actions, through our work, historically, been keenly attuned to the needs of your work. Uh, that being said, I want to really let you know that I understand how difficult it is to adhere to your original job description when so many different things are really pulling you in different directions on an urgent basis. So Sarai, keep up your reports, keep up the quarterly report, and by the time we get matrices in place for the next quarterly report, perhaps you'll have a little bit more time to dedicate to what is actually your job, to what is actually uh, responding to uh, you know, the original job description and work plan that was outlined for you. Sarai, you have my deep respect, admiration, and my support every step of the way. Thank you, Sarai. Notice I didn't ask you any questions, didn't add any more to your workload at this point in time. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you. Um, so I, I just wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about my objections to this general, this plan in general in some ways, and it's over-reliance on government provided housing and government solutions. Um, you know, this isn't a once in a century crisis. It's actually occurred multiple times over the last century. Uh, one only has to think of the post-World War II housing crisis uh, where we have had Levittown formed uh, and suburbs became something as the solution. Um, what we've done though in this particular crisis is we've over a hundred years, we've developed zoning, building codes, and done things to make housing more and more expensive and less available in this country. And that is the real issue. Um, in fact, last week we were talking about adopting another fee that would infect homeowners and, and people renting, which was a stormwater fee. Every time we turn around, we're doing things that are increasing the cost <clears throat> of living, you know, through government action or restricting the ability to provide additional housing through government action, whether it's a new floodplain ordinance. We have to have some part of this plan that's trying to help relieve regulatory burdens and free up the private sector because we can't solve the housing crisis from the government side. The way the, the housing crisis at the end of World War II was resolved was private sector, Levittown, suburbs. You know, there's so little Oregon that is actually developed and impact by urban and, and even suburban development. Yet we're, we're so restrictive. And then you look at places like the city of Eugene that artificially manipulated their urban reserve study, you know, back when they did you know, envision Eugene to purposely not expand to allow for affordable housing to be built. We have to change that. All of these strategies of us constructing affordable housing, government is the most expensive way to build housing. We don't do it well or cheaply. So we've got to build something into these strategies that's about removing barriers for the private sector to supply front doors. And I don't care whether they're high-end front doors or low-end front doors, the more doors we have, the less they'll cost. Which leads me to a metric I'd like to track, which is housing burden percentage. Because that's the real measure of whether we're making progress or not. You know, if we're still up in over 30% of our folks are severely housing burdened and 60% are, are somewhat housing burdened, we're not making progress. I don't care how many units we put on with of affordable housing through Homes for Good or, you know, what we do in the way of land banking. We have to move that needle and we can't do it without the private sector building front doors. We need to bust down some barriers around that. And that's really where I want to see some part of this plan address. I love the part of the plan where we're trying to help out with workforce issues because that is a big portion of the barrier. 
is is a skilled workforce uh and, and the private sector being able to help us out with this but um yeah we just we really have to stop talking about government doing everything that's going to solve this housing crisis thank you commissioner are there any other commissioners um commissioner trigger Thank you, Chair. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I, as someone who was not on the board when it was adopted, I did track the development of this plan and I'm very excited to be here for the implementation. A um, couple of comments, um, somewhat to Commissioner Bozovich's comments about some of the gaps in this plan and the challenges um, around housing. I think if we're gonna talk about that, we can't ignore the um, the fact that one of the greatest challenges is that wages have not kept up with the cost of housing, uh, as well as the other um, demands on families' income, such as childcare affordability, uh, early um, and other educational supports and transportation costs and so on. So there's a lot of inputs that feed into housing instability. Um, and as a local government, I think it's perfectly appropriate that our plan largely focuses on what we as a local government can do. And I don't see anywhere in the plan where it suggests that this is the totality of what needs to be done um, in the community to address the housing crisis. Um, so I do understand your, your concerns about the gaps in the plan. Commissioner Bozovich, I think there's, there, there are several others um, if we're going to go there. Uh, one of the pieces I see and I don't know that this necessarily belongs in the housing action plan, but it is a body of work that we could be talking about that gets some at what I just mentioned, some at what Commissioner Bozovich mentioned, which is our government affairs work and looking at what kind of legislation is being proposed that we could that we are tracking at the least, but at best what steps we could be taking to more proactively be informing and shaping um, public policy at the state level that then affects our ability um, to implement this plan or for others in the private sector um, to be good partners and do the work that they want to do to help support our goals around housing. So I think that's another area we could we could look at for um, for some real richness and opportunity to have some real impact. The last area I want to address and it goes to I really appreciate the overarching tone of the presentation and talking about the historic nature of this crisis. And when I think about the historic nature of the housing crisis, to me, that means it's historic in that we have an opportunity in this moment in time to affect the future, but it also requires looking back into history to see how we got here and the opportunities and obligations that we have um, to, to do some course correction and to do some repairing of harms that have been caused by things like exclusionary zoning and lending practices and so on. So to that end, when I look at um, the metrics, for example, I wonder, uh, I would love to see the group think more about some subsets of how those metrics could be tracked and then expressed um, and that we, we apply this equity lens to the outcomes and the metrics that we're tracking, not just to the problem and how we got here, right? So that we maybe look at things like units and affordability, but within that we have some subsets around, um, you know, how we're helping build generational wealth through home ownership with black families in particularly, but communities of color more broadly um, with single woman headed households um, and other just subsets that help us get at how we are using this plan to um, to to really embrace the, the historic nature and the opportunity to correct past harms because of structural and systemic um, practices that we have uh, inherited and that we have a choice whether to perpetuate or to or to correct. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, many of these have been statements not asking for a response from staff. Are there any other um, statements or questions on this topic? We have 15 minutes before we're going to have to recess, which is plenty of time. Um, okay, well, I, I would just like, there's, this is, this is a difficult for one for me to get my mind around because I used to work specifically in moving 
private money with government incentive structure to move that private money to address different issues. And so for uh, appreciating what Commissioner Farr mentioned, because I know staff are running around and, and understaffed. Um, I would like to understand better, not for discussion now, but maybe next time, um, Commissioner, exactly what you meant when you were talking about all five of us support this agenda, but that support isn't, but, but Sarai might be having, there this initiative might be having issues with the same level of support from its other funder, because I don't understand that. Um, I also- On any time you want to go or privately, whichever you wish. Um, well, I would, I would, I'm all for both. Um, I was, I was just suggesting that either you or Sarai, that that actually be a topic of discussion because it sounds to me that that becomes the first impediment <laughs> in moving forward. Um, but I'm speculating. Um, I was just going to make a few other points if I may. Um, another is, is that, um, Judy, several times you mentioned that you are in the process now of applying for dollars or for resources. And I would hope that you keep this board apprised of specifically what you're applying for, how it relates to this vision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that'd be great. Thank you. As a part of these updates. Um, there's just so much here. Um, I think all of us have a bit of the truth and the truth is broader than any one take on it. For example, I agree with Commissioner Bozovich about various regulatory permit fees and other government processes aren't necessarily the answer. But I also think that when we do talk about World War II, you also have to look at the GI Bill. You have to look at the fact that there was a federal commitment to public housing. Uh, and so there are so many intervening variables. Um, one thing that I see missing here, I don't think we have the competence, the, the capacity on the staff, but that's what partnerships are all about, is partnering with institutional private funds that are organized to build housing. Um, with the Springfield Economic Development Agency, we are looking at a couple of proposals for publicly owned land, right? Nine acres that CETA owns and acquired. Um, these proposals, one of them I know is talking about uh, several hundred, like over 500 housing units and over 40% of them being uh, working family affordable with, with mechanisms to enable those families to lease with purchase to own options. Um, so that they're built as condos. I mean, you really got to get granular. And therefore, I'm just on a high level saying I would be more than happy to assist. Connect with some large private institutional funds. Find out what they need to incent them to build in Lane County. And let's develop some informed partnerships with some clout. Um, having said that, it's such a large topic, I have no further input at this time. Uh, well, you have one other thing, if I may. You talk about workforce. Um, I am, I'm sure others have been invited to an April 16th um, discussion from the sheet metal workers about an entirely privately funded high school program that feeds people into apprenticeships with the sheet metal industry so that after they graduate from high school, one year of their apprenticeship is done. Um, other trades are developing those. So again, if you don't leverage the workforce development that's already out there and privately funded and the partnerships, not just from LCC, but our own workforce investment board, there are also opportunities, I believe, there to make some significant impacts. Thank you. I know that was sort of broad ranging, but those, those are my inputs. Are there any other commissioners we have time um, that would like to ask questions or make their comments before we close this item on the agenda? Commissioner Farr. Sure, Bernie, I can do two sentences in response to your uh, question. There may be long sentences. Um, 
regarding the commitment of this Board of County Commissioners, I've worked with each one of you in different phases and for a different length of time, and I've never witnessed any greater level of commitment among a body than collectively we have as, as these five county commissioners. You just outlined, uh, Commissioner Bruni, uh, the, the need for leveraging outside resources, outside money, and you actually talk about ways to do it. Commissioner Buck, as long as I've known Commissioner Buck, you have been digging deep to, uh, to create better housing conditions for people. Uh, Commissioner Trier, I met you in, uh, I think it was 2004, and I've ne you've, never, you've never stopped in your work, commit, committed work to people living in poverty. Commissioner Bozovich, you continued uh, throughout the time that I've met you to work on ways to add housing, to, uh, to, to make housing more affordable. And uh, so I think my, my point there is that Sarai has a great body of support from this Board of County Commissioners, both individually and collectively. Um, I can't speak for each one of us other than what I've witnessed each of these County Commissioners doing. And it's been magnificent and it continues to be so. And I have a magnific magnificent optimism, optimism for the future. On the second part, uh, Sarai has two boxes. That was one sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a long one. You know, there were there were there were hyphens, uh, <laughs> even I think one colon involved in that sentence. Um, uh, but on the second part, you know, Sarai's job has was originally outlined to have two um, two bosses, two reports of the city manager and the county administrator. Um, and I think that uh, historically, the report to the county administrator has been pretty well defined and pretty well acted upon. It hasn't always been for not for no reason, but it hasn't always been that way with the with the city. Consequently, the the Sarai's governing bodies are the Board of County Commissioners, who the administrator reports to, and the Eugene City Council, which the city manager reports to. And I think as as we get those two in line, once we get past the urgency of today's COVID related, the pandemic related the urgencies, that we can expect a greater meshing there, which we, I think is going to help Sarai. And I'm correct me, Sarai, if I'm way off base on this, I think it's going to help Sarai to be a little bit more supported in the work that she prescribed does and uh, and uh, and will describe for the future. So those two, I think uh, two long sentences, Joy, I apologize for that, but really. Uh, don't be silly. Uh, don't be silly, of course. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there any other comments? Um, Judy, this may teach you to offer to make a presentation before it's scheduled, but thank you so much. Do, Judy and Sarai, is there anything that has been mentioned that you'd like to respond to? We have a few minutes. I, Tara, I think you gave, each of you gave us some really great points. Um, and while the presentation had a lot in it, I think the comments were also rich and had a lot in it too. So definitely want to explore a little bit more um, and I'm excited for the work that's to come. So thank you all for your time and your comments. It was very helpful. And one quick, sorry, um, as we do, just because this is a quarterly update and I want to be reflective of trying to give you the information when we do submit information for a funding opportunity, um, rather than wait for that next quarterly update, is right. it uh, my understanding that I could just you know, email you in terms of here's what we've applied for or going to a, 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 a attempt to apply for and, and get your buy-in and, well, actually probably not buy-in because you can't have that um, without a meeting, but just information sharing. I, I, I think that would be wonderful. I'm speaking for myself, not the body. I think that would be wonderful. I think that you can explain why you're going after what you're going after and how it fits into the vision. And I think uh, as long as none of us hit reply all, we can provide whatever support to you individually um, to make it even richer. So thank you so much, Judy. Sarai? Yeah, I, I will just echo what Judy said. Um, I took copious notes of your comments and appreciate what uh, you all had to offer for uh, this conversation. So I believe next time we come back, we should have a, a more, uh, I say, robust report for you all um, and, and some suggested metrics to identify some of these other pieces um, that came up in this conversation. So I really appreciate that. And um, thank you. Thank you all for, for having us. And, and if you would, please also uh, 
respond to Commissioner Buck's request because that would be have been mine too that relates to um, Corinne's group and whether they can continue to partner with us in this regard. Um, thank you, Sir. On what I'm going to go back to number eight because there is no thank you very much both of you. There is no executive session today. Um, I'm going to hold other business so that this body can recess um, and commissioners can tend to their business. Steve, there's a couple of minutes. I see you on. Did you want to make any comments at this time? Okay. So we are recessed until 1.30. Thank you very much.